We welcome all of our new online listeners. Hi, my name is Dr. Stephen Finney, the hosting pastor of XL Church in IOM America. My wife Jane and I are blessed that you decided to join us. XL represents Exchange Life. Our church is an outreach of IOM America. Everything we do sits upon the pedestal of compassion. So let's get started. Enjoy the worship, illustrative videos, prayer, and weekly message. Hi, I'm Don Moen. Whether you've received a doctor's report that brought fear to your heart, or maybe you have a loved one facing a medical procedure today, or maybe you just need a touch from God. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Tis 
is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the sin the Lord Jesus Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more, Lord, oh, trust you more. Jesus, we want to thank you for the privilege to work our way through the book of Revelation. As we discuss the details relating to the seal of your country Israel and the remnant of the 144,000 bloodline Jews, we're going to need your understanding, Lord, as we go through this particular message. I know for many, Lord, every time that they open the book of Revelation and attempt to read through it, Confusion oftentimes settles in. Father God, we stand against that confusion and we boldly come before the throne asking that you would release the Holy Spirit to give us perfect understanding of this book. As we discuss the details that are within each of the chapters, we know it is going to take a supernatural revelation within the life of Jesus Christ by way of the Holy Spirit. So we choose this day to rely completely on the spirit that lives within us. Cause every believer that is listening to this message to be able to put the pieces together according to your divine holy plan. As for me, Lord, there's nothing more special than the country of Israel. I have learned so much about your promises and your doctrines by studying the book of Revelation and getting to know the country of Israel past, present, and even the future. So today, Lord, as we discuss the remnant seal, we're going to be trusting in you and you alone that you will show us the divine way and understanding of these scriptures so that you can empower us to share it with others. I know the book of Revelation was never meant for unbelievers, it was a message that you gave directly to your beloved John to give to the seven churches. So we need your empowerment on how to communicate this to other indwelled Christians. We pray in the power and the authority of Jesus' name. Amen. We are on a journey, a journey through the book of Revelation. Our main theme is unfolding the power of prophecy. One of the key things we need to keep in mind here is that the book of Revelation is not a book of prophecies. It is prophecies that you've been given since the first day of man being fulfilled. We're honored that you decided to join us. We certainly expect you to be challenged and blessed. Most Christians today avoid the study of this book 
There's probably good reasons to that because of the supposed symbols that are within this book. We need to take special care of those symbols because those symbols are communicating exact truth about the book of Revelation. As for our little fellowship, the Lord has blessed us with a deep understanding of his prophecies. I personally have been studying them for over 30 years. We pray that all who listen today will be motivated to study his final words to the seven churches. Today, we begin our lesson with the remnant seal, the seal of Israel. Let's get started. Today is number 27 in our series. As I just mentioned, we're going to be talking about Israel being sealed by the living God. We're going to put a special focus upon the 144,000 remnant bloodline Jews that will be saved during the second half of the tribulation that will be led by Satan. Let's take a look at our scripture for today. Israel's remnant seal. We're going to be reading out of Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 8. It says this, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having a seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and sea, saying this, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manesh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Iskar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Let's take a look at the remnant converted and sealed. After the opening of the six seals of the sealed book, and after God destroys the false deities, their satanic worshipers, and the ungodly governmental leaders, the Lord reveals to us an intermediate space of time between the sixth and seventh seal, great peace and tranquility. During this time, the 144,000 remnant Jews, pure bloodline Jews, are converted and sealed. Before we talk about the details in regard to the 144,000 being sealed, let's take a moment and talk about the four winds held back. Take special notice to the four winds diagram so that you may understand exactly where in this timeline this truth is being revealed. It is difficult to determine the exact meaning of the four winds, but we can be certain According to the Greek word anemos, it is the breath of God, meaning a great calming was instigated by God. Within this context, it includes the holding back of evil and corruption, which recently aroused a great deal of trouble and persecution for the 144,000. Only God can imagine what that group of bloodline Jews had to go through in the second half of Satan's great tribulation. In the Hebrew and Greek, the Holy Spirit is often compared to the wind. Unfortunately, spirits of destruction are compared to the four winds as well. However, in both views we see God creating a great calm. He personally, through these angels, hold back these winds. This signifies a respite for the salvation and sealing of the 144,000 remnant Israelites. While Satan is known as the Prince of the Air, during this respite, his powers will be bound. The Prince of the Air 
is evil, natural, and demonic. On the other hand, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, will have the attention of all earth dwellers, particularly the remnant Jews. Looking at that timeline to the extreme left, you will see the church age. That first orange bar that we are approaching is the very first second of the seven-year reign of the Antichrist. As you can see there above the blue line that the first three and a half years is fake peace, probably defined in modern terms as socialism. The second three and a half years is when Satan reveals and unfolds his wrath upon all those who are living on the earth. This includes the 144,000 bloodline Jews. That second orange bar in that gap is where this remnant sealed group of 144,000 Jews are given the great seal or the mark of God, which is 777. Since Satan will be so evil and destructive during this period, God had to create a respite where it was 100% calm of the natural winds and the spiritual winds. After this is done, it ignites the 1,000 years of judgment. That is the simplicity of our lesson today. Let's talk a little more about the four winds, the winds of doctrine. In Ephesians 4, 14, it says, As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Here we find three prophetic elements that must be kept in place to understand what is being communicated. Number one, these are called the winds of the earth because these demonic afflictions can only affect the lower heavens, which are classified as the earth and its domain. Now scripture clearly shows us that God's resting place is in the upper heavens and is always clear and free from any type of earthly, natural, or demonic things. Number two, they are restrained by the ministry of angels, standing on four corners of the earth, intimating that the spirit of affliction cannot go forth till God permits these spirits, and that the angels minister to the good of the Bride of Christ. During this period, of course, that's the 144,000. Then number three, their restraint was only for a season, and that was till the servants of God were sealed in their foreheads. Seven, seven, seven. God has a particular care and concern for his servants in times of temptation and corruption, and he has made a way to secure them from the winds of doctrines. Let's take a look at what it means to be sealed by God. No man or spirit can break it. Have you ever thought about the idea of God sealing something? Well, if man makes a seal, it only takes another man with a bit more wit to break the seal. But if God places a seal on a matter, well, let's say that it would take someone bigger than God to break it. God gives us an account of the sealing of the servants of God. Number one, God handpicks angels for two separate tasks. While some of the angels were ordered to restrain Satan and his demon followers, another angel was ordered to place God's mark on a distinguished group of faithful servants of God. Number two, the mark of God distinguishes them. The seal of God was set upon their foreheads. A seal is known to only him, and as plain as it appeared in their foreheads. By this mark they were set apart for the mercy and safety in the ungodly, horrific times to come. Three, God is specific about the number of those who were to be sealed. And as we have learned, that's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. The key note of prophecy is very important at this particular time. 
in this list, the tribe of Dan is omitted, perhaps because they were greatly addicted to idolatry and the order of tribes is altered, perhaps according as they had been more or less faithful to God. Plus, the tribe of Dan joined the new kingdom of Saul, representing the Antichrist, as the first king to show his children a difference between satanic leadership and godly kingship. Of course, that was David. After the death of Saul, all the tribes other than Judah remained loyal to the house of Saul. Still after the death of Ishbotheth, Saul's son and successor to the throne of Israel, the tribe of Dan joined the other northern Israelite tribes in making David, who was then king of Judah, king of a reunited kingdom of Israel. However, on the accession of Rehoboam, David's grandson, in 930 BC, the northern tribes split from the house of David to reform the kingdom of Israel as the northern kingdom, which, by the way, are the descendants of the tribe of Dan, who was known for resisting Israel. But regarding the sealed few, some take these to be select number of Jews who were reserved for mercy at the destruction of Jerusalem. Others think that time was past and therefore it is to be more generally applied to God's chosen remnant in the world as a whole. But I'm not one of those. I believe that these 144,000 bloodline Jews are pure in every single one of them and no matter what nation that they were living in were called up supernaturally by the Holy Spirit and the living God to unite and come back to their roots. This proves that God means what he says. Before we move on to discuss the details of the 144,000, we need to be reminded of Matthew 3 verse 1. It says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Man has always interpreted this and other passages as God coming to set up his kingdom on this defiled earth even though we know, at least the well-informed believers, that the new earth is going to be the center of the universe and literally will be the final resting place for the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, and I can assure you this earth is not going to be that place. Taking a look at our critical note, this is critical for believers to understand. The reconstruction as Christians those that believe they must rebuild the new Jerusalem for Christ's return believe God was not literal when he said he was going to burn this earth. They work day and night out to conquer communities, governments, and religions to prepare the earth for this Christ. Well, I do have a bit of news for them. All their work is for the wrong Christ. It will be for the seven-year reign of the Antichrist. Satan's domain is here on earth, and God's domain is not. God would never set foot on a defiled land. Never. He is not to touch foot on this earth since the day that he walked in the garden in the cool of the day to discipline Adam and Eve. Since that time, he has sent representatives of his kingdom to reveal and make known his presence. Angels, Christ himself the Holy Spirit, prophets. So you see, he can't put a holy city, Zion, on this defiled piece of dirt. This earth will have to go through the baptism of fire. Not to confuse you, but the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will descend upon this particular earth, but will not touch the face of the earth. It will literally hover over the old Jerusalem. And there's obvious reasons for that. After the rapture takes place, and after the Holy Spirit is removed from this earth and taken up to its resting place, God's heaven, to be with the bride of Christ, the announcement of the temporary kingdom of God on earth will be resumed. Here's the passage we find that God commissions the 144,000 converted Messianic Jews to preach 
the gospel of the kingdom of God. Let's take a look at those four gospels. Number one, the gospel of grace, which is the message that we preach in the age of grace. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Secondly, the everlasting gospel. This is mentioned in the book we are studying out of Revelation 14, 6. This is what is preached at the closing of the Antichrist seven-year reign. Number three, my gospel, which is found in Romans 2, 16, and it says this, On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Now, the my gospel to which Paul refers is the gospel of grace of God in its fullest development. It includes the revelation gospel. The difference is, it includes the rewards for the authentic believers in Christ. And finally, number four is the gospel of the kingdom of God. The good news that a kingdom of righteousness will be temporarily set up within the new Jerusalem, which hovers over the earth for the full 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. So you see, the gospel that the 144,000 preaches is a bit different. And I can certainly understand why so many Christians have beat this verse up and made it to be something that it is not. Another good way to remember this is, today is the day of the gospel of grace, life of the groom. And at the end of the seven year reign, it will be the age of the king. The 144,000 will be blessed with the same spiritual gifts given to disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Although I do believe these gifts are active today, in this time, they will see God's power poured out through the gifts in a much mightier way than we have seen in the past. One particular manifestation that I believe is going to be used most effectively is the gift of tongues. These missionaries will be able to speak every known language in the world. Satan will not be able to shut these witnesses up, not even by his language barriers. Those who do not choose to receive the message of this 144,000 will turn and follow the Antichrist with every ounce of passion they can muster up. Satan will then give them his mark, Mark of the Beast, and they will be put in line for damnation with God. Once you receive the mark of the beast, it is over, my friend. No grace for you. The unpardonable sin after the rapture will be the mark of the beast. Today, the unpardonable sin is blasphemy, disrespect against the Holy Spirit. Knowing the times and numbers of times in Scripture is critical. The preaching and teaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God will continue throughout the complete seven-year reign. Once the seven years is said and done, the battle of Armageddon will take place. Jesus will sit on the throne in Jerusalem, in the temple of the new Jerusalem, and will reign for 1,000 years. And yes, we the bridal members of Christ will reign with him. That's according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. The 144,000 sealed missionaries from the tribes of God are special messengers used by God to fulfill a mission specifically designed for this time. They are specially called, commissioned, ordained by God, sent, and sealed. Nobody can hurt them after they are sealed, not even that old dirty devil. This chapter is special. God takes time to show us the great seal over this selected few of 144,000 Messianic Jews. The way I like to look at it is this group of special believers is doing the cleanup on aisle seven. They are doing what we Gentiles were not able to do while we lived on the earth. I will even be so bold to say that this time, the church of the emergent Laodiceans will be so lukewarm that they will have lost what it means to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's no wonder that Christ spits them out of his mouth. God has never been without witnesses on the earth. 
and the lukewarm church put God in a place where the 144,000 were needed and required to fulfill his eternal mission of deliverance. God gave mankind every chance possible to listen, and now it's time to suffer some of the vengeance of God. Let's take a look at some of our bullet points that pierce the heart. During the days of Elijah, God set aside 7,000 who did not bow their knee to Baal, which is interpreted as Satan. That's out of 1 Kings 19, 18. God saved Daniel and the three Hebrew children in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. God has consistently been in the habit of saving faithful witnesses. And I have good news. He always will, even during the most trying times on earth. Found in Romans 11, verses 4 through 6. And it says this, But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, there has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. The remnant according to the election of grace is an amazing factor. The 144,000 will be a brave group of Christians that refuse to bow their knee to the Antichrist or any other of his cheap followers. Now think this through. This group of believers will not have the Holy Spirit moving freely to protect and bind as they go. This group will be empowered by the Holy Spirit and will have a special dose of willpower not to bow. Remembering that this group bears the mark of God on their foreheads. And that alone intimidates Satan and all of his followers. Let's talk about the counterfeit of God's seal, the mark of the beast. As you most likely know, Satan is not an ordinary leader. And he is not an originator. He cannot create one thing that is original or from his hand. He simply looks to what God has done or is doing and replicates it. Unless the followers of God are reading and studying the word, Satan can easily deceive the elect. If they hear about God marking his children, then when Satan marks his children, they will think he is the living God. God was the first to mark the foreheads of followers, the 144,000. Now the Antichrist comes along and requires all to receive his mark or else. Much is to be said in chapter 13 about the mark of the beast. But for now, know that God is the real deal and Satan is the counterfeit, not the other way around. Where are the members of the lost ten tribes? Actually, they're all over the world. Scattered throughout nations and when God is ready for them, he will call them forward. You and I are to focus on the lost virgins and while God focuses on the lost tribal members. God is serious when he states he will blot out the names of those who slander his name. And it states literally, it shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he will boast saying, I have peace though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart to destroy the watered land with the dry. The Lord shall never be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man. And every curse which is written in this book will rest on him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Then the Lord will single him out for adversity from all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant which are written in this book of law. Any man, woman, family, or tribe who attempts to introduce idolatry into the land of Israel should have their names blotted out from under heaven and that they would be separated from the tribe of Israel. Ouch, that is not good. You know, like the tribes of Dan and Ephraim, 
allowed Jeroboam to set up golden calves to be worshipped. Yes, one of these was set up in the tribe of Dan. That's found in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 30. This is the reason why the tribe of Dan and Ephraim was replaced with Joseph and Manasseh in the book of Revelation. So what's up with the four corners of the earth thing? Didn't God know the earth was round? In the Greek text, the four corners, about north, south, east, and west, the points of eternity. And just in case you haven't heard, the universe is not round. It's forever in the past and forever in the future. As for verse 3, when the angel said to the four angels, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. He meant exactly that. Satan is pulling out every stopper he can to block the sealing of those 144,000. Satan has watched God win more wars through the ages with fewer men. He knew he was in deep trouble. So angry was he that God knew that he would have to stop the four winds until these precious few were saved. The four groups of people must be understood to deal rightly with the word of truth. Those four groups are Jews, children of Isaac, the bride of Christ, the church slash Christians, three Gentiles, lost nation, and four Muslims, children of Ishmael. In the beginning, there was just one race, the family of man. It stayed that way until God called Abraham in Genesis 12 and promised to make him into a great nation. He was the first one to be called a Hebrew, according to Genesis 14:13. At that point, everyone else became known as the nations while Abraham's offspring were called Hebrew. The word Gentile is actually of Latin origin and it means nations or foreigners. The equivalent Hebrew word is Goyim. Even though Jews are Hebrew, the Muslims claim to be God's ordained firstborn of Abraham through Ishmael, the child born out of disbelief and haste. Here's our dilemma. The Jews have the prerogative to claim the firstborn rights of Abraham because of their bloodline being that of Isaac, the firstborn God promised to Abraham. This is why the Muslims hate the Jews, and thus why the Jews like-mindedly despise the Muslims. And this is also why they have been fighting over the land of Israel since these two brothers were old enough to swing a sword. I will be addressing the War of the Brothers many times in our study, but this will clarify the seal of the 144,000 and why it is so important. Any Muslim, Jew, or Christian knows that Jerusalem is the center of the universe. Each understands the basic knowledge of God, who is the God of Abraham, will come and rule from this very hill. This is such a significant piece of land to obtain that the final war, Battle of Armageddon, will be fought just a little north of this very location. You probably already know who's going to win, but be assured that it will be a battle to end all wars. This war of all times will be so intense that it will take Christ himself to come and fight this group of races, the Muslims. As I talk with people regarding this topic, I find that most people lack an understanding of some of the most basic facts that are mentioned in prophecy, like Christ coming to draw a sword on the descendants of Ishmael. In the last days, God, through his son Jesus Christ, will come to the earth on a mission to execute vengeance on Teman, Islamic Arabia, and Kushan, Islamic Sudan. The Word of God and most of the historical writings verify the authenticity of the Bible and what it says about this event. A fact the Word of God further states is that God is on the side of the Jewish people or the Hebrew people. 
and he is against the descendants of Ishmael, Muslims. Isaiah 19 tells us that God will come to Egypt, Islamic control, of course, to demolish its empire and its people. And here's what Isaiah 19.1 says. The oracle concerning Egypt, behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of Egyptians will melt within them. I do plead with you over something. Don't be as most arrogant Christians. God does not speak in rhymes and riddles. He is a God of literary exactness. If he says that he is coming on a cloud and that cloud will deliver him, his son, to the land of Egypt, then that is exactly what he will do by the letter of the law. So why Egypt? I challenge you to read your Bible from cover to cover to discover the answer. There are over 600 passages that reference Egypt, and each of them divulges evidence that Egyptians are the enemy of God. Most historians who are worth their salt know that Egyptian empire was established and built by the descendants of Ham and Ishmael, and that any nation that binds themselves with Egypt will be on the list to receive payback from God. Yes, I'm afraid that includes America. When push comes to shove, all nations will be put in the position of choosing whether they will support Israel or the Islamic nation. America's peace agreement with Egypt in 1945 would create a dilemma if Egypt were ever to go to war with Israel. You've heard the notion of grudge carriers. Humans suffer with this ideology every day, all day long. God remembers every single sin. He remembers every form of persecution. He remembers everything that Satan and his people have done, and he has written it down. He will bring it all forward again, not only for judgment, but for revenge. It's been an honor to serve you today. It is our hope that this message stimulates an eternal and internal revival through his indwelling life. Always remember, though, the Word of God lives in you if you're a true born-again indwelt believer. For he is the Word. When you study this complex book of Revelation, the Spirit will bring it alive. You can be assured of that. Until next time.